Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This past Monday, we had a very informative presentation by Mr. Saad Solomon about recidivism and ways that we can improve reentry in this country. Today, we're going to be expanding upon that topic, talking about recidivism and public safety. And we are privileged to have uh, Kings County District Attorney Charles Hines with us, who will be talking about these topics. In 2009, District Attorney Hines was reelected to his sixth term as District Attorney of Kings County, New York. He has served numerous important posts in both the public and the private sector throughout his career, ranging from New York City Fire Commissioner to a Special State Prosecutor. He is a distinguished author and novelist and is currently serving as an adjunct professor of trial advocacy in three New York City law schools. In regards to the topics of recidivism and public safety, in 1999, Mr. Hines created the Calm Alert, or Community and Law Enforcement Together Public Safety Program. This program supports individuals who are on probation or parole as they re-enter their Brooklyn communities. In 2005, he created the Girls Reentry Assistance Support Project, or GRASP, which is designed to meet the needs of young women returning to the community after incarceration. Mr. Hines is now working on an alternative to prison program for mothers and their children through a nonprofit organization which has been named after his mother, Regina Drew. The Drew Foundation is planning to operate the first residence of its kind in the country in which women will be permitted to remain with all of their children in a secure, community-based setting while receiving intensive trauma-focused rehabilitative services. Now, I'm certain that we can do an entire presentation on all the accolades of Mr. Hines, but we came here to hear him speak. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming the Honorable Charles Hines. Thank you, Michael, and thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, the, uh, what I think, uh, or I hope to accomplish by the time I finish, is to uh, make you understand that uh, I run a very, very non-traditional prosecutor's office. Uh, it's probably because I'm a recovering defense lawyer. And uh, that I learned to my chagrin many, many years ago that there were assistant district attorneys in the various counties in New York City who thought they were going to enhance their career by throwing uh, clients of mine in jail who were drug addicts. And I thought it was just stupid, but that's the way it was um, in New York City in the 80s. I had the privilege of being elected uh, a district attorney in 1990. Uh, I, I ran in a three-way primary for district attorney uh, in Fort Kings County, which is a, a county of 2.5 million people. I ran this primary for the Democratic nomination in 1989. And in Brooklyn, we, are, we limit Republicans to 50,000. If it goes over 50,000, it's a Class E felony for which is a mandatory jail sentence. And so that's winning the election, winning the primary. And so I had a lot of time from September through January to figure out what had happened to my county. Now, uh, I spent uh, a number of years in the Brooklyn DA's office as uh, a senior trial assistant, and then chief of the Rackets Bureau, and then first assistant. But from 1975, when I uh, was appointed by the governor and the attorney general to investigate nursing home abuse uh, in New York State, uh, I was uh, away from local law enforcement. So I, well, I knew it, would be, it had become very, very uh, violent in Brooklyn. I didn't know the reasons. I mean, it, uh, my house in Flatbush was, uh, was burglarized four times in the five years before I ran for district attorney. And three of my five kids were violently assaulted. And if you uh, pass by my uh, block uh, in those days at six o'clock in the morning, I used to go up and get my newspapers uh, armed with a club, a golf club. And so we, I, I had the opportunity to, to uh, uh, look at uh, the, uh, the seriousness of, of uh, the crime problem in Brooklyn with some very, very uh, experienced uh, law enforcement professionals who would, who would work in the DA's office and had gone on to, to other jobs. Um, the state of the county at the time was that we, 
with our 2.5 million people. We had 158,000 serious felonies every year. We had about 780 murders a year. One out of every 15 of us was the victim of a violent crime. As I pointed out, uh, I was running as a crime victim, as the, the parent of, of crime victims. Brooklyn, who, which used to be referred to as the city of churches, had become the fifth most violent place in America per capita. And with seemingly out of control uh, drug-related crime, um, the, uh, the response in New York City and in New York State uh, was that uh, the way to deal with this was to, dr to build endless warehouses of despair. You put enough people in prison, you're gonna drive down the crime rate, which was utter nonsense. It should have been fairly clear to people who were uh, in the city government, New York City government, the New York State government, that you couldn't prison, prison build your way to public safety. It just didn't work. And for example, between 1980 and 1993, New York City, uh, its local jail called Rikers Island, went from 7,000 people to 22,000. Uh, New York State, which had one of the more progressive governors in the state, in the country at the time, Mario Cuomo, who used to say that his, he'd say sadly, his uh, tombstone would read, he built more jail cells than any governor in the state's history. And I would point out to him, because we were all friends, that uh, the tombstone, if it was accurate, would say you built more jail cells than all of the governors in New York State combined. And he went from 22,000 jail cells in 1982 uh, to well over 60,000. And the madness continued with uh, Rikers Island in New York City reaching more than $30,000, uh, incidentally at a cost of $90,000 per inmate. $90,000 per inmate. And uh, the city of New York went to over 30,000 jail cells at Rikers Island, and the state was nearly 75,000 jail cells by the time Governor Cuomo left. And the more jail cells we built, the more assistant DAs we, uh, we hired, the more cops we hired, uh, the, the, the uh, crime problem kept on going up, and no one can figure out why. No one could figure out that uh, drug-related crime had been off the charts. And that uh, the drug war that they started wasn't working. And so it was clear to us that the way we had to deal with drug-related crime was an alternative. Uh, programs that would take drug addicts out of the criminal justice system. And, and give them rehabilitation. Now in 1990, that was not a, uh, a well thought through uh, approach at all. Nelson Rockefeller, who had been our governor for a number of years, and author of the, uh, the infamous Rockefeller drug laws, had spent millions of dollars on attempting rehabilitation. And of all of the rehabilitative services that Rockefeller and his administration came up with, it didn't dawn on them that the one component that was missing was job training and job placement. And that's why it was a failure. And Rockefeller finally threw up his hands and said, everybody in New York State who's in possession of drugs on a felony level is going to prison for a mandatory jail sentence. And that way, that's the way we're gonna get the, uh, the major traffickers. Well, it was nonsense and it didn't work. Now in 2003, Brooklyn had about 32,000 uh, serious felonies, uh, down from 158,000. It had 230 murders, uh, down from 780. And one out of 89 of us was the victim of a violent crime rather than one out of every 15. And Money Magazine said in 2003 that Brooklyn had become one of the 10 best places to live in America. And there were many reasons for this uh, change, and obviously one reason is that uh, the crack cocaine epidemic passed. But the more important reason 
uh, that I, I attribute is the way in which we decided to look at drug-related crime. And we began in Brooklyn, and it's been, I'm proud to say, replicated by other parts of New York City and, and in New York State. And what I'm going to tell you this afternoon, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, um, is about four programs. And now, I slept all the way out here. I would hope that some of you would schlep into Brooklyn, uh, where you can see the programs. I mean, I, I really uh, have little patience for public speakers who tell us all the wonderful things they do. They basically sound like snake oil salesmen. And, and they don't show you what they have done. Well, you can come to Brooklyn and you can see what I'm going to talk to you about today. Well, we looked at the state of drug-related crime and we said there's something profoundly stupid, uh, morally indefensible, and fiscally unsound about sending drug addicts to prison. And drug addicts at that time were going to prison on the installment plan for life. And so we designed something called the Drug Treatment Alternative to Prison. Now in government you can't have a successful program unless you have an acronym. And the acronym is DTAP. And DTAP is fairly well known in the law enforcement community across this country. And what DTAP did was very, very fundamental. You take someone who's charged with a drug crime, you take them out of the criminal justice system, you defer the prosecution, and then after a series of uh, residential drug treatment, we began with a, a place called Daytop Village, uh, and we've gone on to now we have about 16 different uh, providers of, of services. And you put them into residential drug treatment for between 12 and 18 months. And at the end of that period, as they come back into a society, uh, you give them job training and job placement. And I put on, on, on board in the office someone who is responsible for that, for that program, the job training and the job, job placement. But the real critical change was, and I was warned by some of the senior executives uh, with me at the time, uh, all of whom have gone on to other things because uh, they didn't want to get with the program. And the program for me was, as a former defense lawyer, I was not going to run a traditional prosecutor's office. It made no sense to me. And so we were going to redesign the office of a public prosecutor with one goal in mind, that the way you achieve public safety and permanent public safety is recidivism reduction or reoffending reduction. And if you don't do that, you're baying at the wind with any other solution. And so we offered the drug treatment program, or DTAP, to drug sellers who were selling for their own habit. And I was warned by you know, the three senior staff members at the time that this is your first elective office. And if one of these people leave residential drug treatment and commits a very serious crime, you're going to be in deep trouble next time you try and run for uh, re-election. And my answer was that I'm going to pray every day that it doesn't happen. And it hasn't happened. The 20, nearly 23 years I've had this job, we have never had a serious problem with someone leaving drug treatment and committing a, a serious crime. They, they, they've committed crimes, but nothing uh, like the, the, uh, the crimes that my senior staff was concerned about. Um, Columbia University's Center for Alcohol and Substance Abuse, uh, or CASA, conducted a five-year study of the drug treatment alternative to prison. And that CASA was led at the time by Joe Califano, Jr., who you might recall was Secretary of Health and Human Services to President Jimmy Carter. And halfway through the study, which was going on endlessly, I called Califano and threatened to kill him because I couldn't understand why it was taking so damn long to validate something that was demonstrably validatable. And he said, uh, be patient, which is no one has ever accused me of being patient. But I waited, so no other choice. And in a five-year study, you can look this up online, he found a number of things very important. First, the, the, the cost of residential drug treatment is less than half the cost of incarceration. That should be no shock. That 87% of the people who graduate from our program two years out never go back to, to prison. And nearly 70% of the, 
of the folks who go through that program. Never go near the criminal justice system again. They become taxpayers rather than tax drainers. Uh, and of course, it has a significant re uh, impact on recidivism reduction uh, because uh, recidivism is reduced by more than half by the program. Now, we'll have a graduation ceremony in the spring. We have it every year. And uh, uh, they, the folks here at Fairley Dickinson have my contact number. I would be delighted if uh, you could come to Brooklyn and see it. It is something you will not forget to see people who are, as I said, lifers uh, on the installment plan being reunited with their loved ones, their children. Uh, and it's, it's just a, a, a very, very dramatic thing to witness. Um, but we also have, as another uh, drug treatment program, drug courts. Now, during the Rockefeller reform debate, uh, you, you would have thought that in New York State, every prosecutor, and we have 62 elected prosecutors, got up uh, each morning frothing at the mouth, figuring out how they can put uh, a drug addict in jail that day. Uh, and not know that we have 176 drug courts in New York State, 176 of them. And the gatekeepers for each of these drug courts is the local elected district attorney, because district attorneys in New York State at least, and I think it's true of New Jersey and many other states, uh, have realized that uh, uh, putting people in jail because their addiction makes no sense. So uh, you can come to our graduation ceremony next spring, uh, or you can come anytime you want to our, the largest drug court in New York State in Brooklyn. And we have three other drug courts as well. We have two for, um, uh, one other for, for felony charges and, and two misdemeanors. Um, the second program I want to talk to you about is, uh, Michael mentioned, uh, is this uh, Community and Law Enforcement Resources Together. Remember, the acronym is important, so it's COMALERT. And it was the, the brainchild of my first assistant, who is now the chair of the Human Rights Commission for New York City, Pat Gatling. And she came to me one day, maybe 14 years ago, and said, you know, we have a terrible problem with folks coming back from prison. And they come back to Brooklyn at the rate of 3,000 a year. And six out of 10 of them get rearrested within, the same, within a three year period, and more than half go back to prison. And she said, I have a simple design, which I think we can reduce that recidivism rate. And it was uh, having the formerly incarcerated who came back to Brooklyn directed to a central site by the parole board, um, uh, be mandated for uh, alcohol and drug uh, uh, testing, random testing, uh, be given wraparound services, you know, uh, computer skills, uh, interview skills, resume writing skills and be prepared for a transitional employment uh, for six to eight months. And if you, anybody from Brooklyn here, by the way? There you go, okay. So when, when you're in Brooklyn on the holidays, go downtown, to the downtown area, and you'll see these guys in blue uniforms doing what appears to be sanitation work. Those are our clients. These are folks who are in transitional employment. They get uh, a, 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 a stipend, which is above minimum wage, and there's no tax because it's a grant. And they get this between six and eight months. And money is withheld from each uh, pay period. And at the end of their uh, transitional cycle, they get, they get $1,000 in cash, which allows them to buy clothing uh, to go for a job interview and to, uh, to put money down on, a, on the, uh, the rental of, a, of an apartment. And then they move on to the more permanent employment level. Now, um, the guy who runs this program is a sort of a quirky guy named George McDonald, who is most proud of the fact that during the Dinkins years, he would be arrested on a regular basis for the uh, felonious crime of feeding the hungry and the homeless at Grand Central Station. And he's to, he brags still to this day that he's got a longer record than John Dillinger ever had. But if you said to George, why do you have sanitation work for these guys? He gets very angry and he says, it's not sanitation work, it's discipline. And that's one of the, the factors with those who are formerly incarcerated. 
they have no discipline. They don't get up uh, uh, at any normal hour to go to work. They wake up when they wake up and they go off to looking for targets of opportunity. And so disciplining them to get to work eight o'clock in the morning and work a full eight hours is George's contribution to our transitional employment. That's not the only transitional employer we have, but he is among the best we have. They move on to the next level, which is the permanent employment. Now, that became probably the most vexatious thing I had to, to deal with, and yet I had a track record in getting employers in Brooklyn to hire, for example, recovering drug addicts. So 23 years ago, I sat down with the uh, manager of a of a, uh, a, a factory in Brooklyn and asked him if he would hire uh, drug addicts who were in recovery. And he bristled and said, you want to put junkies on my factory floor? And I said, well, do you have alcohol rehabilitation? And he said, yeah, sure I do. I said, well, yeah, it's the same thing really and I'll give you a better class of addicts. Drug addicts are a much better class of addicts than alcohol addicts. And I know well, well about that because I grew up with one of those. And I'll get to that in a moment. And he hired this young fellow and that began the, the uh, building a track record. So when I went to permanent employers on my Com Alert program, it, it wasn't all that difficult. Although, you know, I, I had some trepidation when I walked into a plant and said, I got a guy who uh, would be a terrific employee. Uh, he did 15 years for robbery one. And, Greenhaven, yeah. but there was no sneers because I had a track record. And <clears throat> the, uh, the permanent employment uh, and all of the steps to the permanent employment uh, has led to uh, a spectacular finding by Professor Bruce Weston of Harvard University, who conducted a 22-month study of the Kamala program and found that uh, we reduce recidivism by more than half. So instead of six out of 10 being rearrested within three years, it's two out of 10. And he found that some of the factors uh, that made this successful was uh, a GED program. Because again, another indicator of people who get themselves in trouble and, and go off to uh, our uh, state prison system, leave high school, uh, either don't go to high school or leave high school after a, a year or so. So giving them a GED and preparing them educationally is, is the, uh, one of the ways in which we, we reduce their recidivism rate. And it's our hope, and, I, and I've been working very, very closely with Pref, uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Pollitt, the president of Mega Rebus College in Brooklyn, to prepare these guys for um, community college work and then baccalaureate degrees, and we even have on the planning board uh, graduate degrees as well. Matter of fact, one of the people who lectures my uh, uh, reentry uh, program is a guy named Divine Pryor, who will tell these folks, uh, I used to have a number after my name like you guys. Uh, now I have letters after my, my name. He's a PhD in criminal justice. Now, he was a guy who was in, the, in jail for nine years and realized that he had no business being in jail. And, and made a, a, a very, very uh, determined effort that he would get through education, the kind of liberation that comes with, with education. You can see the reentry program. And, and I, I'm, very, I'm proud of all four of the programs I want to talk to you about, but maybe this is one of the more dramatic things to see because it's every Friday at 1.30 uh, and you walk into the rear of the, this room. I don't want to embarrass these fellows who are in the room. They are, unfortunately, the face of criminal justice in, in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, they're virtually all African-American. And that's what our criminal justice system looks like. It's a profound tragedy. It's an obscenity, but that's the way it looks. And you can see by their body language, they're not happy to be there. They've been directed by their parole officer. They have no, no choice. And you can see that they're angry. They are bored. They've heard all this crap before. And then something magical happens. Halfway through, you see them straighten up. As they become convinced, as they hear each program offered to them, that we are very serious when we say we don't want them ever to go back to prison. And they can make it if they follow the programs that we offer them. 
Um, and I always uh, uh, make an analogy that's like watching the Holy Spirit that, that, defend, that descend on the people in Rome. It's extraordinary to watch. I, I took one of the chief judges to, uh, to the uh, site and she said to me, you know, Joe, when you were describing uh, this transformation, I thought it was Irish nonsense. And she said, but I can see it's absolutely true. See, because none of these people have in their pocket a design of how I go back to prison. Instead, they think they're all going to make it, but they have no structure. Many of them have no family anymore. The family got, got tired of them, got tired of seeing them going back and forth to prison. And they have no hope of ever making it. And that's why there's such a high recidivism rate. Um, and I hope you'll come and see that. You're going to have to see all these, by the way. I'm going to get your name before you leave. And if you don't, you know, you may have problems with the district attorney. Okay? <laughs> the, uh, the next program, and, and, and by, by the way, there's a, another thing that's important. I'll, I'll get to it as the last step. One of the other indicators of criminal activity uh, are kids who are surviving, survivors of domestic violence. And I'll get to that in a moment or two. The third program has to do with reversing a profoundly stupid mistake made 60 years ago in New York City. In New York City, at that time, you had local courthouses everywhere. They were called magistrates' court, they were called municipal courts, they were called special sessions, and they were in the neighborhood. And if you wanted to see justice up front, you walked into one of these courts. And then someone got this silly idea of centralizing the jury, uh, the, uh, the, the court system, because that would make it much more efficient. Well, all of the credibility went downtown in the five counties of New York City. Uh, as the folks lost the opportunity to walk into a court and see justice firsthand. And so, a number of years ago, the chief judge of the state of New York at the time, Judith Kay, probably the, the most effective chief judge we ever had because she created what, what she called and what I worked with, with her about was problem-solving courts to understand that the courts can be used to solve societal problems. If, if you design it the, the, the right way, if you use social, social workers, for example, uh, to, uh, to, to, to solve problems. And she asked if I would support a local community court, and I said, absolutely, not only will I support it, I'll tell you where you ought to put it. And it's the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, which probably means nothing to you, but uh, 15 years ago, you would not go to Red Hook in, in Brooklyn without a platoon of Marines from the 3rd Marine Division. It was arguably the most dangerous place in the city. And the reason I wanted in Red Hook, there was a, a wonderful school's principal named Patrick Daly, who uh, was informed that one of his kids, nine-year-old child, had been beaten up in school and had left and gone out to uh, the, uh, the, the open grounds of the Red Hook housing developments. Uh, our projects in Red Hook are the, are the largest in New York City. And Pat Daly went out, it was a cold, rainy day, and he got caught up between two uh, young drug gangs firing at each other. And Pat Daly was shot uh, in the crossfire and was dead before he hit the, the, uh, uh, the ground. And I went to the viewing and to the mass and was told by the leadership in Red Hook that the city had turned their back on Red Hook, that Red Hook used to be a, a wonderful place to live in, and the city didn't care about it anymore. And I said to Judith Kay, this is the place we, sh we should experiment. And she said, uh, what do you need to get involved? And I said, I need a desk, a judge, and two flags, and we can do the rest. And she said, oh, you know, need a lot more training and planning. And it took six years until we finally got the thing off the ground. And I remember going down to uh, a uh, deputy attorney general in the Department of Justice to make the final pitch to get the funding that was necessary to, to uh, break ground and, and to, to, to uh, create this community court. And I laid the, the case out, which I thought was a substantial one, and the uh, Attorney General, De Deputy Attorney General said, you know, I'm, I'm going to support this. I think it's a great idea. 
And I said, I'm happy to hear that. And I walked to the door. And I said, by the way, General, all I really needed was a judge, a desk, and two flags. He said, I was warned about you. But it went up some eight years ago. And the leaders of Red Hook will tell you that is the reason why Red Hook has been transformed into one of the five safest places in, in uh, New York City. And th that's a place, you know, the, the first go going to visit our drug court or going to, to visit uh, our reentry program, you, you would have to be escor escorted, escorted. In the Red Hook court, though, uh, they welcome visitors. The court officers are like tour guides. They love to show off their court with walk-in services for domestic violence, for drug abuse, for anger management, for alcohol abuse. Um, there are three police precincts in the general area that feed all their cases into Red Hook. And the judge in charge of Red Hook uh, has a range of services, either rehabilitative services or uh, graduated penalties, including jail. But it's something you ought to see. Now, there's a place called Brownsville in Brooklyn you might have heard of, and that remains one of the more dangerous places that we have in New York City. And um, that's, wh that's where the next uh, community court is going. And what I hope to achieve um, by the time I end this uh, uh, career in the DA's office, I, you've heard of Bob Morgenthau? Everybody's heard of Morgenthau, right? He was 90 when he quit. I'm, I'm going to beat Morgenthau by one year. But at the end of that, though, what I want to see is the reversal of that stupid decision so that we have local community courts, which bring justice back to the people of our city. Uh, and then finally, um, I grew up in the nightmare of, dom of domestic violence. I saw my mother beaten up when I was just five years of age, and uh, it continued. My father was an alcoholic. It continued until I was old enough and strong enough to, to, to stop it. And what I've tried to do uh, as one of the most in important priorities for me is to do something as often as I can, whether it's daily or weekly, to see that no victim ever had to suffer the way my mother did, and no kid had to watch what I had to watch. And we've incrementally changed uh, our approach to domestic violence. I, I created the first domestic violence bureau in the country in 1990, in the first month that I was district attorney. And I selected the 10 toughest trial lawyers I could get. Uh, some of them had been students of mine. And the mission was go and take no prisoners. Put these people in jail. Every time you get a batterer, throw the key away. And then I realized over the years that just as you cannot prison build your way to public safety, you can't use punitive measures to deal with social issues and cultural issues. And I've often said that if, if my father had available to him the kind of services we have uh, in Brooklyn, the uh, alcohol rehabilitation, anger management, then we would have had a relationship. It's that we didn't talk for the last 19 years of his life, so he lost his only son and I lost my father. Uh, what, we, what we have done using social services, which I have on staff, by the way, uh, 27 social workers. Now, when I tell that, to prosecutors in other parts of the country. I'm on the, the board of directors for the National DA's Association. They look at me as if I have two heads. And, you know, my answer to, the, to them and their concern is, what better discipline is there between a prosecutor and a victim of child abuse or sex abuse or domestic violence than a social worker? And you ought to try it, and it has worked. And one of the reasons for that is that I found early on that the prosecutors in the Domestic Violence Bureau were getting burned out. They couldn't understand these guys and women who'd come from uh, bureaus where, where complainants, victims, were actively uh, in pursuit of, of getting justice for, for the victimization. And yet in domestic violence, they couldn't understand why these women, typically women, would not pursue the batterer. They didn't, if, and if you didn't grow up in that, in that uh, nightmare, you would know that there is a fear factor, physical and mental fear. There is concern of economic uh, uh, enslavement for women who uh, are in a position where they can't get a job, and there's a lot of reasons for it. The Family Justice Center, which is the last 
um, initiative of, of our domestic violence program opened uh, in 2007, and it has 37 co-located agencies on the same floor of 350 J Street, which is my, my uh, building. And it provides every conceivable resource uh, to end the domestic violence of the people they service uh, and to do something about the surviving children. And again, to, uh, to understand that that is one of the indicators of people who commit violent crime because these folks uh, in prison or, or coming home from prison, having watched uh, the violence in the home as I had to, feel the same anger and fury and frustration I felt, and it were not for the fact that my mother uh, got me counseling. If you don't have counseling, uh, they tend to, to lash out and, and commit crime. And one of the uh, benefits we have of our Family Justice Center is a, uh, a grant from Joe Torrey uh, and his Safe at Home Foundation. Joe's father was a police officer, and, and like my father, was a drunk who used to bounce around the local bars with his buddies after a tour, tour was over and pistol whip Joe's mother, Margaret, and, and, uh, and terrify Joe and his siblings. Margaret's place is within the, the Family Justice Center and is a place that I can say without any fear of contradiction is a place that someone can go in Brooklyn who's a victim of domestic violence and not spend one more day in that uh, horrible experience. I'm very, very proud of the fact that Mike Bloomberg, the mayor of the city, dedicated the center to uh, Regina Catherine Jew, who's my mother. And there's a picture of me as a little kid with my mother. And uh, Bloomberg, being a wise guy, said that the, the kid was a substitute because Heinz couldn't look that good. Now, if you come to my Family Justice Center, you'll see the picture and you'll notice I haven't really changed. I have more hair than I had when I was five. Uh, we're very, very proud of the center. We're very, very proud of these four programs, which all are designed to reduce recidivism as the alternative to uh, incarceration. Now, the last point I've got to make, don't for a moment think that I don't put people in jail. I put a lot of people in jail. It's the easiest thing I do. It doesn't take a lot of intellect to put someone in jail. The real struggle, the real difficulty is coming up with programs that prevent or uh, intervene if someone is in the system or help someone when they come back from, from, uh, from prison. If you look at brooklynda.org, you'll review 29 programs that weren't there before 1990, all designed to reduce recidivism while raising levels of public safety. I'll finish with this. The people who go to prison in Brooklyn are typically, as a lot of my colleagues say, very, very bad dudes, because you've got to be a bad dude in Brooklyn to go to prison. I have so many programs. And so the people I'm sending to prison who are coming back have already established their propensity to, kids kill, to, to commit very serious violent crime. And so it, the impact on rehabilitating that population connects directly to violent crimes. And the example I'll give you is that last year, for the first time since 1963, we had less than 200 murders in Brooklyn. And every morning I get a murder report. And this morning I had 51 fewer murders than I had last year. So we're going in the right direction. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. One murder is one, one horrible incident that's too much but we're going in the right direction. So, I thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you again, Mr. Thank you again, Mr. Hines, for your presentation. It was wonderful. Yeah. So once again, uh, we're gonna open this to questions and answers. Um, any of you at 3.30 that need to leave, uh, we're gonna stick around for a little bit afterwards. Uh, Mr. Hines asked more, answer more questions. And I'm gonna open with the first question. And my first question is, you, you talked about in the, in the Comp Alert program, um, how you had some success with temporary employment and then you transitioned them to permanent employment. My right. question is, is now the economic recession and the high unemployment rate in America, mm -hmm. 
uh, specifically in New York, have you seen it more difficult to transition them from temporary unemployment to permanent employment? And if, if so, what measures have you taken to maybe help them you out? No, not at all. I mean, the, the, jobs, the jobs that we typically place our folks in are uh, exterminated jobs, they're, they're jobs involving uh, rug installation, window in the installation. They're not, you know, they're not uh, particularly high paying, although they do pay between thirty-five and forty-five thousand dollars. But what we have done is become an employment agency, and when people say, you know, how can you involve yourself at, at a time when, when folks are saying, you know, I, I can't get a job, and you know, you're, you're placing uh, some guy who's uh, not, nothing but a no-account felon. And my answer is, is, I doubt very much if you're going to be committing serious crimes. This no-account fel felon you're talking about is going to commit serious crimes unless I redirect him. And so the whole, the whole point of it is that with the validation study, with the statistical, uh, realis the statistical reality that six out of 10 get rearrested within three years, and with our validation study it drops down to two of 10, and I think we can knock it down to one out of 10, uh, it would be irresponsible not to be actively involved in, in channeling them to, to jobs. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Hein, for sharing um, all of your, your life's work and some of the accomplishments that you, as well as the city of Brooklyn, or the, the borough, have had with these programs. My question to you is, I noticed that you, you really have talked about how you have a grievance with overreaching deterrence through incarceration and that you want to be focused more on rehabilitative techniques, and that's why you, you've engaged in programs. Right. Um, but as well, many, many people uh, will say that deterrence is the way to go, and we see in our country that we're very focused in this kind of way of dealing with crime. My question to you is, through the success of these programs, which statistically you, you've shown have worked, has that reached the ears of lawmakers um, throughout the country, through other DAs, through other people who have stake in creating these programs and dealing with crime? Has the success of these programs in particular had any implications on the rest of society? Uh, no. <laughs> no, actually, it's, it's not as bad. In terms of drug rehabilitation, many, many more prosecutors today understand that that is the sensible way to deal with drug-related crime, that it, it works, you know, you do reduce recidivism and you, and you, you really increase the job pool and, and your, your tax base as a result of it. The, the one program I, I have a lot of hope for is the reentry program. Now, the National DA's Association uh, has for the last three years a reentry committee, you know, and I go, there are three meetings a year, and I go and harangue them at each meeting and say, you know, hey folks, how long are we going to be debating whether we're going to have a reentry program? You know, read uh, uh, Professor Weston's report, for heaven's sake. The problem is there's a great fear factor. You know, I got to run for re-election, you know. I, I, I'm, I, I can't take that kind of chance. Well, I have an answer for that, too. Uh, in 2005, I learned it was not good for retention for me to indict the Democratic county chairman of my, my county, and I'm a Democrat. Uh, and I indicted him and three of his corrupt judges, and they came after me with everything they had, and if they had moved two and a half percentage points, I'd be line dancing in a senior citizen center. But I sent him and the judges to prison. But I say to them, you've got to take a stand that makes people, under, that makes people understand that you cannot allow this thing to continue with people getting out of prison uh, un and don't connect with them, and then have them predictably commit crime at the rate that, that they do. Now, there's a guy in uh, Fayetteville County, Kentucky. Uh, he and I agree on nothing but our friendship. Uh, and he's a quirky guy. And I was presenting reentry to the National DA board. And he interrupts and says, I haven't heard a thing about victims. I said, really, Ray? And who makes victims? You call them felons, right? And he has a motto for his office. Catching releases for fish, not felons. I said, if I reduce felons, not I reduce victims? So he looked at me, and the next morning I saw him on a coffee line. He said, you know, Hines, you may have a point. And I said, well, he should have said something. Then. He said, well, I'm going to do that. 
Well, last year, that was five years ago, last year someone called me up and said, you're not gonna believe this, Ray Lawson's got a reentry program. So I called him up and I said, Lawson, you're out of the closet on reentry? And he said, shh. So I said, how's it working? He said, just like you said. Now that's Nixon going to China. So I'm very, very confident that we're gonna be able to convince enough prosecutors in this country to have a reentry program. If that happens, we will see crime rates we have not seen in, since the 40s. Yes. Hi. I have a big enough mouth. No. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. I don't know. Hi. Hi, I'm Megan Sachs. I run the criminology program here. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you. I'm, I'm jumping out of my seat as I hear what you're saying because it's what I, I teach in my crime policy class. Are you one of these flabby level liberals? Is that what you are? <laughs> <laughs> huh? I was you're trying to keep me that under wraps, but okay. Um, <laughs> One of the questions I have is for you in terms of where we are going with drug policy. And I'm a big proponent of reentry, jobs, education. It will reduce recidivism down the line. I agree. I also like to look at the beginning. So we know that drug-related crime is responsible for our dramatic increase in incarceration. Right. Um, I also know that there's been a slow peeling back or repealing of the Rockefeller laws and some other of the you know, harshest drug laws. So my question is, are we moving in a direction where we are going to, um, you know, kind of wipe the egg off our face and say, okay, we, we, you know, we kind of failed in this drug war and maybe we take it more into a public health um, arena? Uh, do, you, do you see any higher up in terms of policy, lawmakers, a change in the orientation of how we treat drug crimes? Um, you know, kind of taking this war on crime or war on drugs and putting it in the back seat? Well, you know, we've created the model, and, and when you think of it, 62 elected district attorneys in New York State, uh, and, and district attorneys, by and large, ha tend to be very, very conservative, you know, very, very conservative in their policies. And if all 62 in New York State realize that sending people to prison for their addiction doesn't make any sense, and that's why they run these drug courts or, or work with the courts and the defense bar and the drug courts, that's a step in the right direction. It's also something that has been replicated in many parts of the country. I'm not uh, familiar really with other than, you know, uh, people I, I run across in the National DA's board. But, you know, there it's very, very clear that, that there is a significant change in the drug policy that people realize that prosecuting and putting people in jail because of their addiction makes no sense at all. So it, it, that's the good step. Thank you. Right. Thanks for joining us. So you mentioned towards the, in a couple of, at a couple of points in your remarks, you mentioned that you are an elected official. You, mm -hmm. you, you uh, come to your office through popular elections, but you're also obviously an agent of the law. You help to give shape to the law. You inform your, your offices and your employees about what kinds of crimes to prosecute, uh, what kinds of programs to develop. And the question is, uh, is, do you encounter through your work any tension between uh, these two things? That, you, that is your, your commitment to, to law, your, your work as an agent of law, and this popular connection you have to your community? Um, and if the answer is no, there really isn't a tension, then, then should we be open to uh, more interaction between those, those popular processes and other uh, aspects of law? Well, you know, what, what, I've, what I learned in the, uh, the election that I nearly lost in 05 was that people didn't know about my programs. And so I, I began really an education uh, campaign that it was started in October of 05 and has continued all the way through. I mean, I, uh, I'm out every night. I go to community meetings. I go to uh, uh, police precinct councils. I go to community board meetings. And I talk constantly about the programs, and the main theme has always been, whether it's, whether it's here or wherever I'm speaking, that recidivism reduction or reoffending reduction is the key to public safety. Now, when I uh, wanted to sell uh, the drug alternative program back in, in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in, back in 1990, 
uh, and I just want to make, make the point, no prosecutor in this country was talking about drug rehabilitation, and that, that's not the way we handled it. And so I didn't go to Brooklyn Heights, which is essentially a very, very liberal, progressive area near my office. I went to Bay Ridge, where I live, and a lot of uh, people who uh, are my uh, uh, co-ethics, Irish Catholics, and I remember going to this, this auditorium and getting involved in a, uh, in a uh, somewhat contentious debate with a guy who reminded me of my, my, my uncle, Denny. And, uh, and at one point I said to him, you know, the next time a politician, and I'm a politician, I have to run for office, but the next time one of us tells you there's a prison solution to drug-related crime, you stop listening to them because they're treating you like a child. And that seemed to break the ice with, with him. He understood that because you know he had, he had two things: he hated politicians and he hated, you know, being soft on crime. But he understood that, and that's that's the that's why there's no real tension. Um, I had in the beginning in my office, and I've I've told this to a number of district attorneys who have been elected long after me. A lot of pushback on the programs, you know. There are, there are young people who think it's their, their role in life uh, to put people in jail, as many people as they can. And as, as I often say, you know, you commit a crime of violence in Brooklyn with a gun, a knife, or a bludgeon, I don't want to hear about your early bedwetting problems. You're going to go to prison. But when you come home, I have to have something for you to protect my constituents. And the other benefit, obviously, is rehabilitating you. But I had a lot of pushback. And, um, the way I dealt with the pushback, I, I had a serious conversation with about 50 young people over a year, which really said, you know, maybe this is not for you, because that, this is not the way I'm running the office that you want to be in. So go, somewhere, go to some other prosecutor's office. You can put all the people in jail you want. I have a question. Uh, you talk about the success that you have, well, you and your programs have, when it comes to rehabilitating uh, these individuals that just came out of prison. Right. What are some of the most difficult challenges that you and your programs face while rehabilitating these individuals? The, the real problem for me uh, is not the group we're dealing with. The problem for me is not being able to get the budget makers to understand the need to offer this service to everybody coming home to Brooklyn. There are two, two categories I don't permit. I don't permit uh, sexual predators or arsonists because they have recidivism rates that are off the, the charts. So we send them to the other agencies, but they can't come into my program. But everybody else I, I have. Now, I, I've only been able to offer the program to 1,000 people. We have 3,000 coming back to Brooklyn. For a million and a half a year, I could offer it to everybody and it would have a significant effect on public safety. Uh, the, the, the program that Michael alluded to with uh, women uh, staying home or in an apartment with their children, uh, been academically validated by Columbia University School of Nursing uh, two years ago. And it found that the cost of having a mother and two kids, and a mother who's court involved, court uh, directed, uh, with her two kids in this apartment for an 18-month period is $34,000 a year. Uh, to send that, that mother to prison and put the two kids in foster care, it's $129,000. Now, what the Columbia study uh, concluded was it was dramatically successful. Again, another, a substantial reduction in recidivism rates. Why money hasn't been thrown at the program is something that uh, is endless frustration to me because we are still living in a society that thinks the way to deal with these problems is put people in jail. I had another question um, in regards to the program you're talking about. Um, so the concept is to use that as kind of a punitive measure, but as opposed to the women in prison, they'd be able to stay at home. My question to you is, what is the strategy you're gonna use to, I suppose, lobby the people, the, the legislators that you need to get such a program put into place as opposed to going through a nonprofit organization. Well, maybe you have a much more enlightened legislature than, than we do. You know, it's not like I can pick up the phone and call the speaker and say, hey, I got a great idea. You know, 
I mean, I, I tried for 10 years to get this program up and running. I couldn't get any, anybody in the legislature to support it. And, uh, and that, that's why the frustration was, I don't want to sound like an old crank, because at times I am an old crank. I don't understand why people don't look at this and know that the, one of the more serious problems that faces our budgets is the amount of money that we throw down the drain for incarceration rather than rehabilitation. It's just plain stupid. So, um, you know, we, one of the things that the, the uh, Columbia found was of 12 women who, who got this program, 11 were successful at this tremendous cost savings. Um, but, you know, we'll just continue to harangue the budgeteers and the legislators. And I'll be around for a long time, so we'll see. Are there any other questions? Going in a different direction um, and asking about your, your, your past and your involvement in the uh, Our Beach case, I wonder if you could comment um, either generally or with as much specificity as you want about uh, how you think the landscape has changed in the 25 plus years when it comes to you know, the intersection of law, uh, politics, and, and race. Uh, you see uh, you know, other cases that have a uh, racial dimension, racially charged. Um, other criminal cases today, um, do you take uh, solace in how they're handled, or do you see some, you know, yeah, some mean, dynamics I, I, that are just the, the, the classes that we have to protect in particular today tend not to be people of color, because there was some, there's, there's really a sea change of what's happening. I'm not talking about the President of the United States being elected and being re-elected. Uh, we certainly don't live in a post-racial society yet. We have a long way to go. But the people who are most vulnerable people are people from the LGBT community and, and Orthodox Jews. They, they tend to be two classes that are singled out by the biggest. Howard Beach 25 years ago and today is much different. I mean, I was in the fourth month of this four-month trial. Uh, uh, well, I, was, I was approaching the fourth month tomorrow, tomorrow uh, in that case. Now, 25 years ago, uh, virtually all the cops looked like me. Uh, there was no serious integration of the workforce at any level. Uh, there was a great deal of anger and mistrust, uh, particularly in communities of colors, African Americans, uh, toward uh, the white establishment. Um, when Michael Griffith uh, was a 23-year-old kid who was killed solely for the color of his skin, there was no other reason for it, uh, when he was uh, killed, uh, his family refused to cooperate with the Queens County District Attorney. And one of the reasons was no one from the Queens County District Attorney's office went near the family for 38 hours. And by this time, they had a, the, the cops had locked up a number of kids who they thought were responsible, but with little or no evidence, and without the cooperation of uh, Michael's stepson or his, uh, the rest of the family, those cases were all dismissed. And certainly when I was appointed, the, 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 re, the reaction to the African American community was, there's another white guy that's gonna uh, uh, give us a song and a dance and not find justice for us. Well, I, I think I was able to accomplish, if anything else, that uh, I put my heart and soul into trying that case and, getting, and convicting three of those guys for manslaughter and assault in the first degree and then getting consecutive jail sentences convinced them that I was serious. But nothing has happened that has been more dramatic than the fact that today uh, in the New York City Police Department, a majority of the cops are from the minority communities. And that's all about Ray Kelly, who I, I believe is the best police commissioner we've ever had. So there is, you, you turned on TV 25 years ago, you didn't see anybody of color for, for the most part. Today it's much more integrated, uh, and so on the communication level and law enforcement. In my, my office, for example, it's it's a very very diverse office. The uh, the uh, five top people include three women and and one African American. Uh, so there's been lots of changes, but we have a long way to go.
Another question that I have for you is that um, reviewing your, your biography, I saw that you spent a lot of time um, in the public sector. Um, and there was t I know there was a time period that you worked in the private sector as well, and you've done both, but um, which have you enjoyed more, the private or the public sector? That's my first question. And my second part of the question is, I, from what I read, I think it's the public sector you enjoy more. If, if that's the case, what about it's most gratifying for you? Because we don't have to pay. Well, first of all, I, I, I started in the legal aid society as a criminal defense lawyer, and then I, I represented folks who were charged with crime. And then I made the uh, absurdly stupid decision to go into corporate law, and I suffered for four and a half years. I absolutely despised corporate law and corporate litigation. Some of the dullest people in America were in this environment. And, you know, I had a, I had a, a young fellow come to see me who had left the office six months ago. And he got lucky because I had a shot to adjust the budget and bring him back. And I said, what was the problem out there? You're only there for six months. He said, I did nothing of any good. And he said, when I was in this office, every day I felt like I did something that was worthwhile. And, you know, he's, he's a young guy who understands, uh, you know, a kind of joy to be a prosecutor in an office where you could offer alternative programs, which didn't exist in other offices. So, the, uh, when I uh, remember calling my wife and saying, look, I just spoke to Governor Cuomo, and he's going to uh, appoint me the corruption prosecutor and she said, thank God. And I said, I'm going to take a $160,000 hit. She said, I said, thank God. I said, why do you thank God? She said, maybe you'll start smiling again. I mean, I was just miserable. I was making lots and lots of money, but it was just, it wasn't, wasn't any fun. Now, I like money. My wife tells people that Joe doesn't like money. That's why he's in private and public sector. But when my last ingrate, I had five of them that I raised, when they left, the last ingrate left the payroll, all you ingrates. Uh, it was like winning the lottery, you know? So I never had such disposable money. So, so I have enough money and I'm happy. Are there any other questions? Well, there's no more questions. We're going to end today's presentation. You want to give another round of applause for Thank you. the Honorable Chairman? Thank you for coming.